Hello and welcome to today's session. Now this webinar is for people who have been newly diagnosed with celiac disease. So once you have that diagnosis, you should be offered an appointment with the dietitian. However, there's likely to be a bit of time between your diagnosis and that appointment. So hopefully today's session will answer some of those many questions that you may have about that condition and its treatment. So before we start, a few introductions. My name's Leah Seamark and joining me is Marianne Williams. And we're community gastroenterology dietitians working in Somerset and we'll be taking you through today's session. But I'm also very pleased to welcome our panel of specialists who will be answering some questions as we go along. So I'll ask each of them now to introduce themselves. Hello, I'm uh, Dr Jim Gotter. I'm a consultant gastroenterologist in the Oval District Hospital. Dr Emma Gregg, I'm a consultant gastroenterologist in Taunton Hospital. Hi, I'm Danny Milne and I'm a dietitian based at Musgrove Park Hospital in Taunton. Great, and thank you very much for joining us. So in today's session, we're going to be talking about what is celiac disease and the diagnostic procedure for that. We're going to be looking at the gluten-free diet. As part of that, we're going to be talking a little bit about food labelling and cross-contamination. We're also going to touch on some tips for eating out and whilst on holiday, some information on bone health, which we often get lots of questions about. And finally, we're going to touch on vaccinations. So obviously there's a lot of stuff we're going to be going through today. So we would recommend you re-watch this webinar several times to help consolidate your knowledge. Also, just to highlight, on our website, www.patientwebinars.co.uk, we have produced a number of bite-sized webinars. So these webinars last between anything from 5 to 15 minutes, and they focus on specific topics. So after watching today's webinar, if there's a specific topic you want a reminder of, you could head over to our website and look at some of those bite-sized webinars as well. So let's get going with today's content. So what is celiac disease? So celiac disease is a lifelong autoimmune condition. So autoimmune means when the body's immune system is switched on and it then starts attacking either tissues or cells within the body. And in celiac disease, that autoimmune response is triggered by the protein gluten. So gluten is a protein that you find in various grains, including wheat, barley and rye. And in the UK, it's estimated that one in 100 people have the condition. However, we know that only about 30% of people with celiac disease actually have a diagnosis. So the chances are there's lots of people walking around who have celiac disease who don't yet know it, which is why it's really important to be aware of some of the symptoms associated with the condition. So we can try and improve that diagnostic rate. So there are a few groups of people who are at higher risk of having celiac disease. So if you have a first degree relative with celiac disease, so for example, if you have a parent, a sibling, or your children have celiac disease, your risk of having it increases from one in 100 to one in 10. There's also an increased risk if you have other autoimmune conditions such as type one diabetes or autoimmune thyroid disease. And there's also been shown a higher prevalence of celiac disease in a couple of genetic conditions, including Turner syndrome and Down syndrome. So let's talk more about how celiac disease affects the body. So in celiac disease, it specifically affects the lining of the small intestine. Now, if we were to look a little bit closer at the lining of the small intestine, what you would see is lots and lots of these finger-like projections shown here called villi. And the job of the villi is to help the body absorb the nutrients from the food that passes through the gut. So therefore, by having lots and lots of those things like projections, it increases the absorption area available for those nutrients. However, if you are someone with celiac disease who eats gluten, that can then trigger an autoimmune response, which then leads to a damage to the lining of the gut. And if you were to look at the lining of the gut at that point, it would appear more flattened. And that therefore obviously reduces the surface area and therefore leads to a poor absorption of nutrients. Now, if your gut is not absorbing all the nutrients properly, it can lead to a range of gut symptoms in some individuals. So some of the gut symptoms people may experience prior to diagnosis includes indigestion, various abnormal bowel habits, so whether it's diarrhea or constipation, vomiting, severe stomach cramps, maybe some abdominal bloating. However, we're increasingly seeing other symptoms associated with celiac disease, which have nothing to do with the gut. For example, if your body isn't absorbing nutrients properly, you may have symptoms associated with nutrient deficiency. So, for example, if your body is not absorbing calcium, 
you may have weaker bones, which can lead to diagnosis of osteoporosis, which therefore increases the chances of broken bones and fractures. You may have poor teeth enamel. People often describe symptoms of severe tiredness and fatigue, and that may be linked to a deficiency in vitamin B12 or folate or iron, so anemia. In adults, if you're not absorbing nutrients properly, it may lead to unexplained weight loss. Or in children, it may lead to faltering growth. It may affect other parts of the body. So other symptoms include constant mouth ulcers, abnormal liver function. Some people present with a skin rash, and this is called dermatitis hepatiformis. And this is the skin manifestation of celiac disease. Now, people who have this, they may not present with any gut symptoms, but when they have further investigations, they may still present with the damage to the lining of the gut. Other symptoms with undiagnosed celiac disease may include unexplained infertility. There's increasing evidence that people with celiac disease may also present with some neurological conditions. People may find they're suffering with various symptoms of ataxia, which is caused by damage to parts of the brain. And symptoms may include clumsiness, loss of balance, slurred speech, loss of coordination. We're also seeing some symptoms of peripheral neuropathy. So, for example, numbness in the hands and feet. Lots of people are also describing a sensation of having a foggy brain. Now, a recent study which looked at newly diagnosed people with celiac disease found that three out of five people with the condition presented with some neurological symptoms with severe headaches being the most common. We now have a question for our panellists. So do patients with celiac disease always present with gut symptoms? So the answer is no, they don't. Celiac disease used to be thought of as a disease which was picked up in children who developed diarrhoea, weight loss and often failure to grow. But these days we're often seeing much more vague symptoms. So people might have a few irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms. They may have no symptoms at all and actually be picked up incidentally because they're found to be anemic and they have the investigation to go ahead and biopsy their small bowel, which is one of the things we do when people have undiagnosed anemia So exactly as Leah has already said, there are a whole range of symptoms people can get with celiac disease. So the answer is no, everyone's individual and you may present with gut symptoms, you may present with no symptoms at all, or you may present with a wide range of symptoms affecting the gut as well as other parts of the body. Now let's discuss getting a celiac disease diagnosis. So if you have any of the symptoms or you are concerned you might have celiac disease, the first thing you should do is visit your GP. Now, at an appointment with the GP, they'll discuss your personal and family history and carry out an assessment of your symptoms. If they think it's worth exploring the possibility of a celiac disease diagnosis, the first thing they'll then do is send you for a blood test. Now, in the blood test, they're looking for a specific antibody related to celiac disease. And that antibody is called an immunoglobulin A tissue transglutaminase, or IgA TTG for short. Now, if you have a positive blood test so higher than normal levels of that antibody or if you have a normal blood test however celiac disease is still strongly suspected you'll then be referred to gastroenterology in order for you to have an endoscopy to get some gut biopsies however there are some instances where that may not be the case so for example in children it may be that a diagnosis is made without a biopsy in certain situations And also, due to recent events, including the COVID-19 pandemic, the British Society of Gastroenterology have recently released some interim guidance on celiac disease diagnosis. They are suggesting that celiac disease could be confirmed without a biopsy in certain situations. And the criteria they say should be met to confirm the diagnosis without a biopsy include that someone presents with symptoms consistent with celiac disease, that the blood test they have is 10 times the upper limit of normal for the levels of the antibody IgA TTG, that they're under 55 years old, and that there are no alarm symptoms. If all that criteria are met, at this moment in time, it may be possible to confirm the celiac disease diagnosis without the biopsy. Clearly, there will be some people that don't meet this criteria, and for them, an endoscopy will be necessary. Emma, would you mind taking us through what an endoscopy involves? So an endoscopy is a procedure that you have in one of the endoscopy units, you need to have nothing to eat for the six hours beforehand and nothing to drink for at least two hours beforehand so that we make sure your stomach is nice and empty. You come up to the unit, you'll go into the room and there's usually two or three different ways of having the procedure done these days. It's usually done via the mouth 
Um, we can either spray the back of the throat to make it numb, to make it easy for you to swallow the endoscope, which is a little thin tube about as thick as thick as your little finger. Or alternatively, you can have a sedative which makes you feel woozy, but won't put you to sleep. We'd aim to undertake the endoscopy, which is a quick procedure, which takes less than five minutes, aiming to pass the scope in through your mouth, through your gullet, through your stomach and into the first part of the small bowel just to take some biopsies. It's over very quickly within five minutes. We can send the tissue off to the lab. You would then be able to, your swelling would come back to normal if you've had throat spray. The sedation wears off fairly quickly and you'll then be able to go about your normal day. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. So once you've had the endoscopy and those gut biopsies are sent off to the lab it's there where they look at the biopsies under a really strong microscope and they'll assess the extent of damage to the lining of the gut and that will really determine whether you have celiac disease or not so one of the really important things about this diagnostic process is that it's really really important to continue to eat gluten throughout until the diagnosis is made so you should be having gluten before the blood test and before the endoscopy and emma can you tell us a little bit about why that is we don't want to get a falsely negative reading. If you've already started a gluten-free diet, then the lining will have started to change back towards normal, and it may be that we don't capture the changes. So it's very much, if you have started on the gluten-free diet, you may then get a false negative result at the blood test and the endoscopy. And Danny, can you give us a little bit of information about how much gluten someone should be having before they have the blood test and the endoscopy? There's no real hard and fast rule with this absolute specific amount, but it is a question that we get asked quite a lot. And we tend to say that at least in more than one meal a day for sort of six weeks prior to the blood test would be um, sufficient. So if you're thinking about a gluten containing cereal, a slice of toast in the morning, maybe some breaded fish or chicken in the evening, that kind of thing. But yeah, more than one meal a day. Thanks, Danny. So a question for our consultants. I've had a positive blood test. I'm sure I have celiac disease based on my family history. Can't I just start the gluten free diet, start to feel better and not have the biopsy? A gluten-free diet is quite an undertaking and it's a lifelong undertaking, so it's very important to be absolutely certain that the diagnosis is correct. And it is possible to have a false positive blood test where the, the, the TTG antibodies come up positive, but in fact you haven't got celiac disease. So I think you want to be 100% sure and, and confirm that with a biopsy. So another question we have for our panellists is, I've recently been diagnosed with celiac disease. Will my kids get it and should family members be tested? As Leah has already said, uh, the risk to a first degree relative having celiac disease is about one in 10 or 10%. So it is definitely worth thinking about getting tested if you're having symptoms or any of your family, first degree family members are having symptoms. So that's your mother, father, brother, sister, any children. Um, there is some question about whether people should be tested even if they haven't got any symptoms but again it's something to talk about with your GP. Thanks Emma so it's very much if you have children and they have symptoms definitely go and get them tested or if you do have any concerns it's worth going and having a conversation with your GP about getting them tested. So another question for our panel is following biopsy I've been told I have celiac disease but the biopsy only showed mild damage to the gut. Does this mean that I don't have to be as strict with a gluten-free diet? Unfortunately not. Uh, it's very important to be very strict with the diet and in this case, no, they shouldn't have a trace of gluten in their diet. The, uh, there's still the risk that they will malabsorb nutrients from their diet. So no, you have to be very strict. So regardless of the extent of damage to the gut, if you have a diagnosis of celiac disease, it is a strict gluten-free diet. So another question is, will I need another endoscopy and biopsies once I've started the gluten-free diet? Now, just occasionally practice here is a little bit different around the country. But I think, Jim, you'd agree with me that we hold the view that if someone's well after they go onto a gluten-free diet, their bloods have gone back to normal and they're not having any symptoms, then we really wouldn't want to go ahead and repeat an endoscopy. So it sounds like if a person has started the gluten-free diet and their symptoms have improved and their bloods have returned to normal, you won't necessarily do a en repeat endoscopy. However, obviously, if people do have symptoms, that might be something you consider. We would certainly do that. So if, say, at three, four, five months, they're still having problems, particularly if there's, there's signs that they're still anemic, their antibody level isn't coming down on blood tests, because you'd expect those things to be going back to normal by then, then we might think about whether they've got refractory disease, which is a very tiny percentage of people with celiac disease. But sometimes we need to think about more than just a gluten-free diet. However, 
you know, there's only, it's only worth doing if that is the case. So let's now move on to the treatment for celiac disease. So the only treatment for celiac disease at this time is a lifelong gluten-free diet. So why do people with celiac disease need to follow a gluten-free diet? Well, firstly, the aim of that treatment is to allow the gut to heal. So someone with celiac disease, if they stop eating gluten, it will stop that autoimmune response occurring and then therefore allow the lining of the gut to heal properly. That should then lead to a reduction of some of those symptoms that you were maybe previously experiencing. Now, if you take that all into account, it should hopefully improve the feeling of general well-being and reduce some of those complications that are associated with undiagnosed and untreated celiac disease. Now, some of those complications include malabsorption and some of the symptoms associated with deficiencies of vitamins and minerals. So like we've discussed previously, osteoporosis, anemia, unintentional weight loss. It can also lead to ongoing neurological problems. So the ongoing issues of poor balance or foggy head or ataxia. And there is a small increased risk of lymphoma and bowel cancer in people with untreated or undiagnosed celiac disease. Now, this complication is very rare and the majority of people with celiac disease won't get it. However, it's important to recognise there is that small increased risk. But if you have celiac disease and you follow a strict gluten free diet, that can reduce your risk further to that of the general population. There's also some evidence of issues with an unexplained infertility in people with untreated or undiagnosed celiac disease, as well as preterm birth and low birth weights. But again, if you follow a strict gluten-free diet, your risk will reduce to that of the general population. And another secondary complication of untreated and diagnosed celiac disease is lactose intolerance. Now, this is often temporary, and this will be something that we'll discuss a little bit later on. So let's move on to what is the gluten-free diet? So we've already mentioned that gluten is a protein that's found in wheat, barley and rye. So as part of the gluten-free diet, you need to be avoiding all foods that contain those grains. So you have your obvious sources. So things like bread, pasta, cakes, biscuits, wheat-based breakfast cereals, they'll all contain gluten, so they have to be avoided. But you have some hidden sources as well. So things like sausages, they may contain wheat flour, the Balkan agent, or the breadcrumbs you might find on some breaded ham will contain gluten. Even things that you wouldn't even think of, so things like oven chips. Some oven chips might have a coating of flour on the outside to make them extra crispy when they've been put in the oven. And some brand of condiments, so things like English mustard, soy sauce, gravy granules and yeast extracts, they may all contain gluten. So it's going to be really important to ensure that you can read food labels to help you identify which foods contain gluten. And we'll talk a little bit more detail about that later. So other gluten-containing grains, as well as wheat, barley and rye, are bulgur wheat, couscous, durum wheat, encorn, emma, corosan wheat, pearl barley, semolina, spelt and triticale. So all these grains contain gluten, so as part of the gluten-free diet, you need to be avoiding all of these grains. Now, you may think about those foods and think they make up a large part of your diet, but there's lots of specially manufactured gluten-free foods which can be used as alternatives. So if you go to the free from aisles in the supermarkets, you can find a wide range of gluten-free breads, as well as things like pizza bases, pita breads, wraps, gluten-free pasta, biscuits, cakes. In the frozen section of the supermarkets, you also find things like gluten-free fish fingers, gluten-free Yorkshire puddings or ready meals, as well as things like specifically manufactured gluten-free fajita kits and condiments such as soy sauce. So it's worth going to the free four miles in your supermarkets or some of the specialist online shops and exploring some of those gluten-free alternatives which are available to you. Now, in the past, some of those specifically manufactured gluten-free foods may have been available on prescription, but it really depends on where you live. Now, if you go onto the Celiac UK website under their prescriptions policy, you'll find this useful map and it will tell you whether your area allows you to have gluten-free foods on prescription. Now, if you are allowed to have some gluten-free foods on prescription, it is generally limited to the staple items, including gluten-free bread and flour mixes. But because there's such a wide range of availability in supermarkets now, even if you can't get on them on prescription, you should still have plenty of options. When you start the gluten-free diet, it's also really, really important to try and focus on those foods which are naturally gluten-free. So all your naturally gluten-free food include fruit and vegetables, including potatoes. All your unprocessed meat, poultry, fish and eggs are all gluten-free. Fats and oils, nuts, seeds and pulses, 
oil rice varieties, as well as milk, cream, cheese, and plain yogurts. All these foods are naturally gluten-free, so it's important to recognise that and try and ensure that your diet contains plenty of those foods. Now, we've mentioned a couple of gluten-free grains already, so things like potatoes and rice and pulses, but there are a wide range of gluten-free grains that are now available, and they include things like quinoa, polenta, buckwheat, corn, maize, tapioca, millet, and any flours made from these grains can also be used in cooking to help with your gluten-free diet. So it's quite difficult to try and remember all those grains. So on our handout section on the Patient Webinars website, you'll find a useful handout which has been produced by CLEC UK, and it's the Guide to Common Plants, Seeds, Grain, Seals and Flowers. So it's worth just looking at that and maybe downloading it or printing it out so you've got a useful list of what grains are gluten-free or not. Um, Leah, also we get a lot of uh, patients asking about oats, don't we, and whether oats are safe. And yeah. actually, I think it's important to say that, yeah, oats are safe. However, oats can be cross-contaminated when they're produced in the mill or the factory, because those mills and factories often also uh, mill things like wheat flour, rye flour, barley, etc. So there are grains of those in the factory, and it's very difficult to stop those grains cross-contaminating the oats. So when you see oats that are actually gluten-free oats, it means those oats are milled in a different area completely from where anything to do with wheat, barley and rye is, are milled. So it is really important to look at the oats and check they are labelled as gluten-free. Obviously, you might get oats that are labelled as pure oats or organic oats or 100% oats. That doesn't mean that they're gluten-free. So you really, really must look for that gluten-free sign on the oats. Just because they're pure oats doesn't mean they're gluten-free oats. And a lot of uh, manufacturers, for instance, NEMS or Rude Health, will produce gluten-free products, but they'll also produce ordinary. So you must always read the label really carefully and make sure they're labelled as gluten-free. Now, a very small number of people with celiac disease may react to gluten-free oats as well. So despite the fact the oats are really free of any gluten, some patients may still react to them. And that's because of the protein in oats called avenin. It is very similar in structure to gluten, and it will cause the damage in the gut in some patients, only in some patients. So it's really important to see whether you react to oats. So how do you know if you're sensitive? Well, the idea is that you would eat gluten-free oats and monitor your symptoms and see what happens to your symptoms when you eat them. So Marianne, you talked about how you can assess your tolerance to gluten-free oats by monitoring your symptoms. But obviously we know there's a range of people with celiac disease who may have not had any symptoms to start with. So if that's the case for yourself, it may be something to discuss with your dietitian, And it may be that they consider a blood test to monitor your antibody response to gluten-free oats. So Danny, when you see patients, what do you recommend about when to introduce gluten-free oats? What I tend to tell patients is it's, it can be really up to them. In the past, we may have said to hold off for six months. Um, now we say if we, they want to introduce them sooner to do so and more to monitor it based on their symptoms. So, so long as they're feeling good in themselves, then to continue using them, they start getting some, some niggling symptoms flaring up, then discuss it with the dietitian in clinic and we can have a look at, you know, tweaking that and maybe removing from them, them from the diet and seeing if it makes those symptoms improve. So Marianne, can you tell us a little bit more about drinks and the gluten-free diet? Drinks. Lots and lots of drinks out there and some of them are definitely unsuitable. So your lagers, your stouts, your beers, your ales, they are made with wheat or barley, so they're immediately out of the picture. Things like malted drinks, for instance, which will use barley malt, and barley waters like Robinson's barley water sauce, barley squashes, etc. Um, nothing with barley in at all. There are plenty of gluten-free drinks out there that you can have, you know, water, fruit juices, milk, squash and cordials, as long as you've read the label and checked, fizzy drinks, as long as you've read the label and checked, coffee, tea, uh, cocoa as long as it's just pure cocoa, is gluten-free as well. Um, and things like wine, spirits, gluten-free beers and lagers you can get as well, but they must be labelled as gluten-free. Cider, for instance, is gluten-free. But there are certain drinks that you need to double check. So milkshakes and smoothies may often have gluten added. Cloudy drinks like cloudy lemonade. Vending machine drinks. So for instance, Leah, you, what's your feeling about vending machines? So the drinks themselves may be gluten-free, but if that vendor machine has also got a spout which has the same powder going in from lots of different drinks if that vendor machine maybe has a barley malt drink powder in there as well as a coffee powder 
if that barley malt powder goes through the same spout as a coffee powder, it may become cross-contaminated. So that's something you might need to check. Okay, so be aware of vending machines, but it's not necessarily the drink you're choosing the vending machine. It could be just cross-contamination. Yeah. Um, but obviously you also need to check the ingredients of the, of the ones you're drinking. Sports drinks need to be checked and drinking chocolate. We said cocoa's fine, but drinking chocolate may have had gluten added. So you do need to double check that. So another useful handout to help you identify which foods are gluten-free, which ones aren't, and which ones you might need to check is the Gluten-Free Checklist. Again, it's produced by Celiac UK, and you can either get it via the Celiac UK website or under our handout sections on the webinar website. Now, reading food labels. Now, this is a skill which is going to be really, really important if you start on the gluten-free diet. So we're going to talk a little bit more about how to read food labels to help you identify which foods are gluten-free or not. So the first thing you may look at when you pick up a food item is the food packaging and you're looking out for the phrase gluten free or the cross grain symbol shown here. Now, if a food item contains either of these, you can be confident that it's gluten free and therefore suitable for someone with celiac disease. Now, foods which contain the gluten free or cross grain symbol can often be found in the free from aisles in the supermarket. But it's important to remember that there's going to be lots of foods throughout the rest of the supermarket which are suitable for you if you have celiac disease. So it's worth remembering that just because a food doesn't have the gluten-free phrase on it doesn't necessarily mean it's not suitable for you. So in these instances, what you need to do is look at the ingredients list. Now, food labelling laws state that any major allergen must be emphasised in some way in the ingredients list. So the gluten containing allergens we're looking out for are wheat, barley, rye, oats. So when you're looking through the ingredients list, if you see any of these ingredients emphasised in bold in the ingredients list, you know that that food contains gluten, therefore should be avoided. Equally, when you look through the ingredients list, if there's none of these allergens emphasised in the ingredients list, you know that that food is gluten free and should be safe for you to eat. The only exception to this is if on the packaging it also contains a phrase such as may contain or made in a factory containing and then it lists some gluten allergens. So for example, may contain wheat or made in a factory with gluten containing foods. Now manufacturers may put these on food packaging because they feel there may be a risk of cross contamination. Now if you've picked up a food and the ingredients suggest the food is gluten free but it has one of these may contain phrases, what we would recommend you do is either contact the manufacturers directly or speak to Celac UK who often liaise with the manufacturers anyway and they may be able to give you a little bit more information about that risk of cross-contamination so you can make a more informed decision about whether that item is suitable for you to have. So lots of people are now shopping online so when you are shopping online for your food once you selected a food item you should still be able to see the ingredients list as part of that website page. And again, you're looking for those same gluten containing allergens in the ingredients list. So wheat, barley, rye, oats. And you know that if the ingredients list contains any of those grains, it needs to be avoided. When you're shopping online, one of the benefits you have is that you can apply filters to the foods that you're searching for. So some of these filters may come under nutrition or lifestyle or diet. And within those filters, there's often one relating to gluten. So it may be gluten free or no gluten. So say, for example, you're searching for crisps. If you put gluten free crisps in your search box at the top, it's likely to only produce Juice the crisps which actually have gluten free as part of their name. However, if you put crisps in the search box and then apply your filters, it should bring up only those crisps which have no gluten containing ingredients in their product. However, I would always, always recommend that you do just double check the ingredients list as a safety precaution. So what if you pick up a food which doesn't have any food packaging? So for example, if you go to a deli counter or a bakery counter and there's no food packaging on the item. Now, if this is the case, what you'll need to do is you'll need to ask. So ask someone behind the counter for their allergen information. And in these cases, by law, they should be able to either provide you with some verbal information 
or they may provide you with a written information in a booklet form. But regardless of the situation, you should still be able to find out whether a food contains gluten for foods which has no packaging. However, you do need to be careful if you've identified a food with no packaging as being gluten-free, you need to take into account any risks of cross-contamination. So, for example, in a deli counter, if a gluten-free food has been cut up using the same knife used to cut up a gluten-containing food, there's a risk of cross-contamination there. Or whether a gluten-free food is in close proximity to a gluten-containing food. Is there any risks associated there? So do be careful that you take into account the practices used in places such as deli counters. So even if you've identified the food as not containing any gluten-containing ingredients, you need to take into account if there's any cross-contamination risks. Another thing you can use to help you identify whether a food is gluten-free is to use the benefits that you get from your Celiac UK membership. So if you're on a complete membership, you'll get sent a yearly book, which is a food and drink directory, which lists all the foods in the major supermarkets which are gluten-free. However, it's important to remember to update these monthlies by going onto the Celiac UK website and looking at the list of deletions or additions to that booklet. So just a reminder that the complete membership currently stands at £27 a year and does have discounts for concessions and household memberships. Now, another great resource you can get from your CLEC UK membership is the use of their apps. So, two phone apps you can get from the CLEC UK membership is Gluten Free on the Move. So, all the information that you may get from the CLEC UK website, so whether it's the food and drink information, their venue guides or their recipes, you can get from the Gluten Free on the Move app. And second app you can get as part of your membership is the Gluten-Free Food Checker. Now, this is a more extensive list of foods that are gluten-free because it also includes foods that are naturally gluten-free. And this app also gives you the ability to tailor your search requirements specifically to your needs. Say, for example, you have celiac disease, but also you have a milk allergy. You can apply that filter to that and then it will help you identify foods that are not only gluten-free, but also free from milk proteins. Now, both of these apps have the barcode scanners, which is really helpful if you're going around the supermarket. And one, you either want to check food, or two, you just want to reassure yourself that when you've looked at the ingredients list, you've got it right in terms of it being gluten-free. Now, CLEC UK have recently introduced a new type of membership, so the digital membership. And this comes in at just £15 a year. And again, there are discounts for concessions and for household membership. And with that digital membership, you'll get access to these apps as well as the other digital resources. Another benefit of CLEC UK is their helpline, which you can call if you have any questions about any specific foods. So just to summarise, when you're looking at foods to see if it is gluten free, first off, look at the food packaging to see if it's got gluten free or the cross grain symbol on. Secondly, you might want to look at the ingredients list. So whether that's on the actual food packet itself or on the online descriptions, Remember, if you're shopping online, you can apply the filters, but you do just need to double check those ingredients lists as well. If a food doesn't have any packaging, please, please ask the people behind the counter and they should be able to provide you that information in some format. And CX UK have a great range of resources which can support you in helping to determine whether foods are gluten free or not. Danny, tell us a little bit more about how you use the food and drink guide. We are divided into two sections. The first section covers more of the brands that are specifically gluten-free so we'll have that gluten-free stamped on the label that you'll generally see in the free from section in supermarkets and that's divided further into sections such as cereals bread sauces etc and it does contain some prescribable products as well the second section is more supermarket owned brands and everyday brands that you might see on the supermarket shelves away from the free from section uh, these products are made using ingredients that are gluten free with that section it's divided into um, supermarkets which is really handy if you always shop at the same supermarket you can go straight to that section in the food and drink directory and have a look through and see how many other products are available and um, that are gluten free it makes your life a lot easier and less restrictive in your diet Danny, tell us a little bit more about the apps that we mentioned. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Gluten on the Move covers a lot more things. So like you said, it's got the food and drink directory. So it's an easier way of having it because you've got everything on your phone these days. You can also scan products using that app. So you can scan barcodes, it makes it quick and easy to find. The venue guide, they have accredited restaurants on there, but also restaurants that are recommended by other people using the app. So that could be really handy because you know, everyone wants to know where they can get their gluten-free fish and chips on Friday. There's also the, the gluten-free food checker. Like you were saying, it's much more food-based. What I've noticed is that for some people who have maybe more than one restriction in their diet, so if they can't have lactose or dairy or egg, you can actually filter by allergen um, so that it only brings up things that cover your own allergies, which makes it more personal for you. And there's lots of logos on there and icons so that it's really quick and easy to know, yes, this is safe, no, this one's not, and this one you might have to sort of double check, essentially. So we've talked about how when you read the food labels, you're looking at the ingredients and the ingredients which contain gluten will be emphasised in bold, therefore are generally not appropriate as part of the gluten-free diet. However, there are a few exceptions. Now, one of those exceptions is Codex wheat starch and gluten-free wheat starch. Now, this might be something that you see on the ingredients list of some of your specially manufactured gluten-free breads. Now, you'll see the word wheat in bold or emphasise, and you may think, you know, it's got gluten. However, these specific ingredients are specially manufactured wheat starches that have been washed to remove gluten to a trace level. So these are actually suitable as part of the gluten-free diet. However, if the ingredient just says wheat starch or modified wheat starch, they contain gluten, so would need to be avoided. Some other areas of interest are barley malt vinegar and barley malt extract. Now, there's a lot of confusion about these two because both are actually made from gluten-containing grains. So the big question a lot of people have is, well, how can they be safe for a celiac to use? So I want to go through a little bit about what the difference is and what it means for a celiac. So let's look at barley malt extract, first of all. So barley malt extract is actually extracted during the brewing industry process, and it's usually used in very small quantities in food manufacturing. And some of the foods, the ingredients levels will be at such safe levels, they'll be at 20 parts per million or even less of gluten. So they're totally safe for use. But by looking at the label and the packaging, it's often incredibly difficult to tell whether that food has got barley malt extract at a safe level. What we really need is the manufacturers to label them gluten free. So therefore, Celiac UK have just changed their policy lately and have said, we're not going to advise patients to use these products unless they are labeled gluten free because we realize it causes a lot of confusion. Barley malt vinegar is also part of the extraction process in the brewing industry and it's fermented and turned into vinegar and during this fermentation process the gluten proteins are broken up so well that they leave extremely low levels of gluten. So some barley malt vinegars are actually totally safe. Some barley malt vinegars also have barley malt extract added in small amounts. So again, the only way to be absolutely sure the vinegar is safe is for it to be labeled as gluten-free. So this has caused so much confusion over many years that Celiac UK changed their policy in 2020. And they said, we are no longer listing products containing barley malt extract or barley malt vinegar unless they are labeled clearly as gluten-free. We're speaking to the manufacturers and retailers and we're asking them to commit to labeling these products gluten-free rather than only assuring us that they are suitable for the gluten-free diet. This will make it easier for consumers to check if the product is gluten-free and for us to keep our, date, our information up to date. So just a few more exceptions. So glucose syrup, dextrose and multidextrins. So these can be derived from gluten containing cereals, but the way the grain is processed results in the gluten being removed. So these three ingredients are gluten free, therefore suitable for people with celiac disease. So just to talk a little bit about Celiac UK, which we have mentioned a few times already. So Celiac UK is the patient charity for people with celiac disease and they offer various memberships. So individual, concessionary and household. And they've also recently introduced not just the complete membership, but a digital membership as well, which is at a reduced cost. Now, this table here just highlights what you get from each of the complete and the digital membership. 
So regardless of the membership that you have, you'll get access to the phone app, the online food and drink information, the venue guides, as well as some various other benefits. But if you have the complete membership, you'll also get sent some information in the post, including welcome pack and the annual food and drink guide. So just to say that we would highly recommend that you join that charity. So moving on to cross-contamination, we talked a lot about how you can select foods that are gluten-free. Now, what we don't want to happen then is for your food to be contaminated with gluten because of processes that you may come across within the home. So what we're going to talk a little bit about now is about cross-contamination and how we can avoid it. So cross-contamination is when a gluten-free food comes into contact with gluten. So for example, if you have a slice of gluten-free bread and you put that on a chopping board which has some crumbs left over from some gluten containing bread if that bread picks up some of those gluten containing crumbs that bread has been cross-contaminated with gluten therefore it is no longer suitable for someone with celiac disease now you may ask the question of why is it so important to try and avoid cross-contamination with gluten if you have celiac disease now the issue is we know that people with celiac disease can develop some symptoms in the short term by just the smallest amount of gluten. So even the amount of gluten that you might find in a small breadcrumb can trigger off symptoms in the short term for some individuals. Now, if you have more regular exposure to gluten via cross-contamination, it can lead to longer-term damage to the lining of the gut. So if we were to take a little bit of a closer look at the lining of the gut, it should have these finger-like projections shown here called villi, which helps increase the surface area available to absorb the nutrients from the foods that you eat. Now, if you have celiac disease and you have regular exposure to gluten via cross-contamination, it can damage that lining of the gut. Therefore, those finger-like projections flatten and it reduces the body's ability to absorb nutrients from the food, therefore lead to malabsorption. So what we want to make sure is that if you have celiac disease and you've gone through all the hard work of selecting gluten-free foods, that you don't accidentally consume gluten via the process of cross-contamination. So what we're going to look at today, specifically ways to reduce the risk of cross-contamination within the home. So here's a standard kitchen. One of the first areas you may look at is your toaster. So a toaster often collects lots of breadcrumbs throughout the toaster at the bottom. Now, if you have celiac disease and you're living in a household of people who have normal bread, you may decide to have a separate toaster specifically for your gluten-free bread. Or you may decide to use some of these toasty bags where you can put your gluten-free bread inside the bag and then use it on a normal toaster. Equally, another option would be to use a clean grill. The next area to look at is how you store your food. So whether it's in the fridge or in the cupboards. Ideally, if you have enough space, you might have a separate area dedicated to your gluten-free foods. Or if you don't have enough room, it's a good idea to try and keep your gluten-free foods stored on the top shelf, either in the fridge or in the cupboards. Now, it's also a good idea to specifically label your gluten-free foods if you're living in a household with other people who aren't gluten-free. Now, if we were to take a closer look at some of those items that you might find in a fridge or in the cupboards, there are certain foods which are at higher risk of cross-contamination. So anything that you would put a knife into and then spread it on some bread and then put the knife back in to get more. So things like butter or jam or honey or other sort of condiments. Now to reduce that risk, you either have a household rule that only clean utensils can go in the butter or in the jam, or you may decide to have a separate version of butter and jam specifically for your gluten-free diet, and it's a good idea to label those pots so people know that specifically for you. Another alternative is to use some of those squeezy versions of things like jams, which are available in most of the supermarkets. Another area to look at is the oven. If you have a fan oven, it obviously uses a fan to circulate air to produce the heat. Now, that can blow breadcrumbs and things around the oven. Therefore, it's always a good idea to cover your gluten-free foods whilst it's in the oven. And also make sure that if you are using the grill, it's always a nice, clean grill that you're using to cook your gluten-free foods on. Moving on, another area to look at is things like your cooking utensils, your pots and pans and your chopping boards. Now, you may decide to have separate versions of those specifically for your gluten-free diet, or you may just want to make sure that each time you cook or prepare a gluten-free meal, that you're using clean utensils or clean pots or a clean chopping board. There are a few things that are more difficult to really ensure that they are cleaned enough so that they are gluten-free. So things like flour sieves, 
can be really difficult to get all the bits of flour out. So you may decide for things like a flour sieve to have your own separate one for your gluten-free flour. Now to clean things like your utensils and cooking equipment, you can use soap and water or a dishwasher is fine as well. Now when it comes to repairing food, it's always advisable to wipe down the surfaces so they're nice and clean. And obviously wash your hands for at least 20 seconds with soap and water before food preparation for basic hygiene. When it comes to things like chip fryers, you want to make sure you're using clean oil to cook your gluten-free chips, or you may decide to have a completely separate fryer for your gluten-free chips. When it comes to cooking pasta, you want to make sure that you use clean water to cook your gluten-free pasta. Also, you want to make sure that if you're using the pasta water to add to your sauce, that it's the pasta water from your gluten-free pasta that's being used rather than the water that has been used previously for some gluten-containing pasta, because that's a risk of cross-contamination there. So these are just some ideas to help you reduce the risk of cross-contamination within the home. However, you may have come up a situation such as this person here who said, I've just realised I've eaten some gluten-free fish contaminated with gluten. What should I do? The first thing to remember is don't panic. And if it's just a one-off, it's not going to cause any long-term damage. However, it's important to be aware that you may experience some symptoms in the short term. It's really, really important to get back onto the strict gluten-free diet if this happens, because the more exposure you have to gluten, even via cross-contamination, the higher the risk of longer-term damage to the lining of the gut. Also, it's important to learn from it. So if it's a situation that happens within the home, it's trying to put something in place just to make sure it doesn't happen again. It's also important to raise an awareness. So if this issue with cross-contamination occurred while eating at a friend's house, let them know the issues that it can cause you, but also give them a solution, give them some options of ways that they can reduce that risk of cross-contamination for you in the future. So let's move on to some tips for eating out. Eating out is a, a real challenge for a lot of celiacs and really worries them. Um, so here are some tips for eating out. So check out the Celiac UK venue guide for places to eat. Celiac UK do special courses for chefs, etc., making sure that they know what a celiac diet in, involves. And other Celiac UK members will put up um, a list of venues as well or add to that venue guide with Celiac UK. So check out the Celiac UK about their venue guide and places to eat. Contact your local support group for recommendations and check allergen information when you go into the restaurant. Call ahead to talk to the chef or the waiting staff. A lot of you might be nervous to do that or feel they're being an imposition, but you're not at all. And the chef would much rather that you had a successful meal than that people complained afterwards that it wasn't what they thought. So definitely just ring up, talk to the chef. Don't necessarily talk to the waiting staff when you ring up because they may not pass the message on. It's the chef that you really need to speak to. But when you get to the venue, always communicate with the staff. And we've produced some little um, handouts that you can give to staff at restaurants and you can print them straight off our website. They're in the further information handout section and you just cut them out. And that means whenever you go somewhere, you can just hand them this piece of paper and it says everything they need to know on it without you having to constantly repeat all the information and try and stress what you mean. I would also point out it's also worth remembering to let the staff know that you have celiac disease and you're not just on a gluten-free diet because lots of people are on a gluten-free diet these days for various different reasons it may not need to be as strict as you so i would just say that you should highlight to the staff that you have celiac disease that's a really good point and absolutely because there are so many people now on gluten-free diets who don't need to be strict and that really confuses restaurants because they just put everybody into that band so if you explain that you've got celiac disease it puts you into a completely different category and then suddenly understand how strict you need to be no that's a very good point and Danny, have you got any other advice for people eating out? Definitely agree with the calling ahead. I tell a lot of my patients to do that um, purely because I think, you know, you've got to maintain a good quality of life and you've got to be able to go and do the things that you enjoy doing. If that's, you know, going out for meals. I sometimes say, you know, consider some of the cuisines that maybe use less gluten containing ingredients. If you're someone who likes to get a takeaway or go out for a curry, things like a lot of Chinese foods like use a lot of soy sauce and um, a lot of wheat noodles, etc. So you might find it more difficult to, to get something that you know is gluten free and free of contamination. Whereas, for example, a lot of Indian food uses a lot of chickpea flour. Um, a lot of their products can be more naturally gluten free. That can kind of make your decision a little bit easier. You have a bit more flexibility with the menu. The one thing I would say is if it was fine last time, it's always worth still mentioning it the next time you go. Chefs change. 
um, procedures change and you just want to make sure that they they are aware of your condition. Okay so a question for our consultant is I accidentally had gluten whilst eating at a friend's house I didn't experience any symptoms and so does this mean I can get away with a little bit of gluten occasionally? Fortunately the answer to that is a very clear no. We know that even exposure to just a few crumbs of gluten can cause the problem to occur again in the lining of the small bowel so you go back to losing the important villi um, and your the lining of your bowel goes back to being more flat again which means you'll also fail to absorb certain nutrients and so on so even if you don't have symptoms it's still really important that you keep your small bowel lining as healthy as possible by avoiding gluten 100 percent so moving on to holidays and travel so we often hear in clinic that lots of people once they start on the gluten-free diet they feel quite comfortable about when they're doing it within their own home but the thought of maybe going on holiday either here in the uk or abroad can feel quite daunting so just a few tips to help with that if you're going on holiday to the uk it's worth checking the CLEC uk venue guide to help you identify CLEC uk accredited places to eat in the area that you're going on holiday it's also worth contacting the local CLEC group in the region of travel to ask for any recommendations. And that might be the official CLEC UK local group or even a local CLEC group, which is on some of the social media outlets. So I know our local social media outlets, including things like Facebook and Twitter. It's also worth contacting the hotel and B&B to discuss the need for the gluten-free diet, as well as the need to prevent cross-contamination when preparing the meals. And it's also worth carrying a supply of gluten-free snacks just in case you get caught out on arrival and there's not appropriate food available to you. Now, if you're traveling abroad, I would say it often requires you to sort of research and plan ahead a little bit more to ensure that you can follow that gluten-free diet whilst on holiday. So it's worth contacting the tour operator, hotel or B&B to discuss your need for the gluten-free diet. It's also worth checking with the airline or the tour operator about whether you can carry sealed packets of gluten-free food into that country. because There may be some specific restriction depending where you're traveling. And some airlines may give you extra baggage allowance if you request it. So in order to get that, you may need to get a letter from your GP explaining that you have CLEC disease and you need the extra allowance. Other tips include using the CLEC UK country guides. So if you go onto the CLEC UK website, there's a list of country guides for various different countries. And it will give you some information about how easy it is to follow the gluten free diet in that country, as well as some really useful translation or phrases to help you explain the fact that you need that gluten free diet. You could also explore the country's local CLEC disease organisation, so the equivalent of that country's CLEC UK. And on the internet, as well as the CLEC UK website, you can find really helpful CLEC translation cards for holidaying abroad. And again, it's worth carrying that supply of gluten-free snacks on you if you're able to. And Danny, have you got any other tips for people who are travelling abroad who need to follow the gluten-free diet? Go with what you say about the translation cards i think they're the best thing that you can take because there's so many key phrases on there and um you'll never remember them all no matter how hard you try well you might do if you can speak um several languages um but also kind of have a look at what their local cuisine's like um it might be that you'll take one look at it and think i'm going to really struggle to find something with the sort of food that they do um or you you might think that you you'll be okay but certainly in an emergency you need to have a small supply of, of snacks on you um, and the only thing I'll mention that I've seen on Celiac UK is they do recommend mentioning it for your travel insurance as well. Okay. It can be quite important. Okay, so a question for one of our consultants is, once I start the gluten-free diet, how long will it be before I start feeling better? So some people start to feel better within even a week or two of starting a gluten-free diet, but other people may not have had symptoms in the first place. So clearly it's not going to affect them and they should still persevere with the gluten-free diet, even though they had no symptoms beforehand and they won't have any symptoms afterwards. And then there's the group where their symptoms seem to linger on a bit. So they, they stick fairly strictly to their gluten-free diet or very strictly even, and they still have symptoms that often take two to four months to get better. So you do need to bear with it. Although if you are running into problems still three or four months on, that's something to discuss either with your dietitian, if you're due to see them at that point or your gastroenterologist. Another question is once I've cut out gluten and my gut heals, does that mean I'm cured? Uh, cured in the sense that all symptoms should resolve and you will be able to absorb all of your nutrients so you won't have any deficiencies of any sort, uh, but not cured in the sense that you will be able to then start eating uh, gluten containing products as we've heard wheat, barley and rye. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, pre, a genetic predisposition. Once you have celiac disease, you will always have celiac disease. And if you eat gluten again, 
the problems will occur, how long until they recur and your symptom becomes symptomatic again varies. Some people say they have symptoms the next day, others it could be weeks or months. And don't forget, of course, that some people had no symptoms in the first place. It might have been found uh, when they were being tested and investigated for iron deficiency anemia. They may not have known that, they may, may have been found on the blood test, so they won't be aware of it uh, themselves. So uh, unfortunately, exposure to gluten, more damage will occur to the lining of the gut, so not cured. We're going to talk a little bit about osteoporosis because there is association between osteoporosis and celiac disease. So osteoporosis is when your bones become thin and are more likely to break. And this is associated with celiac disease due to the reduction in the absorption of vitamins and minerals, including calcium, which can occur due to that damaged lining of the gut. So because of that, there is increased requirement for people with celiac disease to consume adequate amounts of calcium. So calcium requirements for an adult with celiac disease is at least a thousand milligrams of calcium a day. So if we were to look at a diet and how you would get that thousand milligrams of calcium a day, that's equivalent to having milk on your cereal, a couple of slices of gluten-free fortified bread, chunk of cheese maybe in that sandwich, a yogurt, a portion of rice pudding and a glass of milk before bed. Now, you may look at that and think that's quite a lot to try and get into your diet most days to meet that thousand milligram requirement. So that might be something that you could discuss with your dietitian at your appointment. But Danny, we've had a question of, you know, if you are struggling to consume that much calcium in your diet alone, should they consider a supplement? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. So obviously it's not just dairy foods that um, are calcium rich, although they do tend to be the foods that have got a higher calcium content, um, but there's lots of non-dairy calcium foods as well. And also if you're following a vegetarian or vegan diet, making sure that you've got a milk alternative that's fortified with calcium and vitamin D is, is really important. Um, what I would recommend is have a look at the fact sheets and see how you can fit that in on day to day. Um, but if you're really struggling, um, a dietitian can help assess the calcium intake in your diet, have a look and see whether you're meeting that target. And we wouldn't want to title one up and not so that they're feeling that they've got to meet exactly a thousand milligrams every day. It's just having that extra awareness, um, maybe in introducing a few more um, portions of calcium containing foods into your day to day life. If you do feel that you need that supplement or if we feel that you're not quite meeting it and we can't modify it more to get some extras in, then yeah, we would we would happily recommend a calcium supplement. And I notice here they've got a very good calcium handout from Celiac UK as well, which you can download from the website as well. Is that right? Yep. And it gives you a list of the calcium contents of various different foods. So you can kind of sit down and figure out how much calcium you're getting from your typical diet. And we look at it on an average, you know, over a typical day, are you getting enough calcium from your diet to meet those requirements of a thousand milligrams a day? If not, it may be that you need to consider a supplement as a top up. What about vitamin D? So vitamin D it helps your body absorb calcium. It's made by the skin when in the sun. However, we know with typical UK type weather, we can't generally make enough vitamin D. So the recommendations for vitamin D are that in the winter months, particularly between October and February, anyone over the age of four should consider a daily vitamin D supplement. So that's about 10 micrograms of vitamin D a day. However, if you're in any of those higher risk groups, so if you're housebound, if you spend most of your day indoors, if you're elderly, if you have darker skin tones, which makes it more difficult for your skin to make vitamin D, that you actually consider an all year round vitamin D supplement. So a couple of questions for our consultants. How is osteoporosis diagnosed and does everyone need a DEXA scan? I'll take the first part of that. The definitive diagnosis of osteoporosis would be made using a scan which measures uh, the density of the bone, uh, which is available uh, in the major hospitals called a DEXA scan. In answer to does everyone need a DEXA scan, traditionally we have done a scan on everybody, but I think we're more aware that many of those scans are negative. And in terms of managing our resources and, and focusing on those that need them, we're a better way of approaching it is probably to do a special scoring system called a FRAX scoring, which I know is already going ahead in the Oval. That would be our routine approach. We wouldn't do a DEXA scan routinely for everyone. We would do a FRAX score, which would take into account the risk factors, of which of course celiac disease is one. But other things we'd be looking at would be their age. So for example, women don't reach their peak bone density until their late 20s in any case. So there would be no benefit in doing a DEXA scan before that. It also looks at whether they've had a fracture beforehand, 
whether they've been on steroids for perhaps another unrelated medical condition. So it looks at their overall health and assesses that as well as their celiac disease and seeing whether or not they need a DEXA scan at the moment. We've mentioned that people with celiac disease are at increased risk of developing osteoporosis because of the likelihood there's been a period where their gut lining has been damaged and not absorbed enough calcium. But there are other things that you can do to help reduce the risk of osteoporosis and promote good bone health. So thinking about regular weight bearing exercises, so things like walking, running, even gardening, anything where you're on your feet and you're carrying your weight can actually help improve the strength of your bones. So actually can, that can help reduce the risk of osteoporosis. Also, anything which helps reduce the risk of falls. So exercises which strengthen the muscles around the bones and help improve balance. So that may be things like yoga or Pilates or resistance type exercise. Anything that strengthens the muscles and helps reduce the risk of falls can help as well. Also trying to avoid smoking and trying to avoid drinking excess alcohol can improve bone health. But if you have celiac disease, it's just remembering that One of the key things, as well as ensuring you get enough calcium by your diet, is making sure you follow that gluten-free diet to make sure that your gut is actually able to absorb the calcium from the food that you're eating. Okay, so often when we talk to some patients about meeting their calcium requirements, they sometimes find that actually they can't tolerate some of those calcium-containing foods, such as the dairy products. And that may be because they've developed a lactose intolerance. Lactose is a sugar that is found in milk and it requires the enzyme lactase, which is made in the gut lining, to help break the lactose down and allow it to be absorbed. Now, some people with celiac disease may develop a secondary lactose intolerance because if you have celiac disease and they have damaged lining to the gut, it may mean that that lactase enzyme isn't produced efficiently. Therefore, there's not enough enzyme to actually break down the sugar. So if you have celiac disease and you have that damaged line to the gut, if you were to consume a glass of milk, you may not have enough lactase to break down all that sugar. So that sugar, that lactose, ends up in the large intestine where it then ferments and causes some gut symptoms which may include the bloating diarrhea stomach cramps so people who are finding they're reacting to some of these dairy products that contain lactose may have a temporary lactose intolerance now if that's the case for you it's still really important that you still get enough calcium from your diet to help promote bone health so that would be something that you can discuss with your dietitian but also there's a really helpful handout on the celiac uk websites or also under our patient webinars handout section which discusses celiac disease and lactose intolerance and talks through about how how you can help manage that remembering that the lactose intolerance is often temporary so once your gut starts to heal when you start following that gluten-free diet you may find that you can increasingly tolerate some of those lactose containing foods and also i think it's important to say that not all dairy products are high in lactose are they so for instance cheese um, and butter and cream are not particularly high in lactose so you may not need to remove those. It tends to be the more milky side of things like the milk and the yogurt and the ice cream that are high in lactose. And they may be the ones that particularly cause you problems. So it doesn't, going on a low lactose diet doesn't mean a dairy free diet. And I think that's really important to stress. Okay, so just to touch on vaccinations and celiac disease. So it's recommended that if you have celiac disease, all adults should have a vaccination against a pneumococcal infection and a booster every five years. And that's due to the potential link of a celiac disease effect in the spleen. Uh, it's also recommended that you speak to your GP about having a range of other vaccinations specifically if you were born between 1995 and 2014 and you should also discuss the potential of a seasonal flu vaccination because having these vaccinations will depend on your personal history now just to go through a couple of other places you can go and get extra support so we've talked a lot about Celec UK and we've just listed here about ways that you can contact them either via their website, their email, Facebook or Twitter. It's also worth remembering that that we've got our bite-sized webinars on our patient webinars website, which does discuss various different topics in small bite-sized sections. Under the further information section of the website, we've also got some short videos by Christian Costas, who's a specialist celiac dietitian up in Bradford, who answers some of our patients' frequently answered questions. We've covered a lot today, so it's now thinking about what should you do now? So if you've been diagnosed with celiac disease, the first thing you should be thinking about is starting the gluten-free diet. Now, to help you with that, we'd recommend that you re-watch this webinar, as well as any of the bite-sized webinars that you might find helpful. Also, start looking through the cupboards and reading the food labels so you can start identifying those foods that you already have at home, which are gluten free. 
and then it's worth going to the supermarket and exploring some of the gluten-free foods that are available to you or maybe place an order on some of those online shops where you can get some of those specialist foods and start thinking about what you currently eat and think about suitable adaptations and replacements to make the diet gluten-free. Now, it can sometimes feel quite overwhelming to completely overhaul your diet, but if you think about what you currently eat, most things can be adapted to make them gluten-free. So it's worth just look, thinking about that and thinking about how you can adapt your current diet to make it gluten-free. Now, we'd also, as we've mentioned numerous times, join Celiac UK and attend your appointment with a specialist celiac dietitian. Now, if you've just been diagnosed with celiac disease, you should be offered an appointment with a specialist celiac dietitian. Now, hopefully after watching this webinar, you, we've covered the basics for you, but if you have any specific questions, make sure you take them along to your specialist diet, celiac dietitian, and they should be able to personalize some of the information for you. Now, Danny, what can someone expect from an appointment with the dietitian? Uh, yes, yeah, so hopefully when you come and see us, you would have um, found this webinar really handy and have, have started your gluten-free diet. So we'll have a look at what sort of stage you're at there. Um, and following on from that, we'll maybe discuss the symptoms that you were having um, prior to diagnosis. So we can use that as a really handy marker. Have you had improvements? Are you feeling any better? Um, we'd also have a look at food diary that we would send to you prior to your appointment so you maybe fill out um three days worth and we can have an ass uh, assess that and look at things like is there any gluten containing foods that you may be not aware of that, is, that are, um done in your food diary we'd assess certain nutrients we might be looking at calcium making sure you're getting enough in your diet if you're someone who's suffered with any form of um, anemia or low B12, low folate, we might be having a look at foods like that in your diet to see if we can increase that to help boost your levels. Um, we may ask for a repeat blood test. Um, if we do, we can have a look at the um, and IgA, TGG antibodies in your, in, and see if that's coming down and normalising, because that's what we would hope we would see as well. And we may also check any vitamin and minerals that um, have previously been low to make sure that they're improving. And essentially, we'll just give you support. We'll make sure that um, you've got all of the information and it's specific to you so that you can um, hopefully maintain a strict gluten-free diet. Brilliant. So thank you for that. So just a reminder, there's lots of handouts that you can download from our website as well as the CLEC UK website, and they are highlighted there. Just reinforces what we've talked about today. And I'd like to thank our panellists for joining us today and answering our questions. So I hope you found that useful and thank you for listening.